Good evening. Welcome to the hotly contested electorates of Western Sydney. I'm Tony Jones and tonight we're broadcasting Q&A's national economic debate from the Riverside Theatre in Parramatta. To answer your questions and debate the economic future of the nation, the Federal Treasurer, Chris Bowen, and the Shadow Treasurer, Joe Hockey. Please welcome them both. Thank you. And as usual, Q&A is being simulcast on ABC News 24 and News Radio, and you can join the Twitter conversation with the hashtag on your screen. Well, economic management is the number one factor that determines how Australians vote. As usual on Q&A, the questions will come from the audience. But to make sure we cover as many issues as possible, we've put some special rules in place tonight. As with Q&A's two earlier policy debates, our guests will have a maximum of just one minute to answer your questions and 30 seconds to answer any follow-ups. As usual, we'll allow some leeway for the toing and froing of debate. At the end of tonight's Q&A, we'll give the Treasurer and the Shadow Treasurer one minute each to sum up their arguments. Let's go straight to our first question, which comes from Rudo Macchiano. I'm a young professional living in, and, and working in Western Sydney. Tired of renting a few months ago, I went to my bank and looked on the market to look at what it would mean for me to own my own house. I was left slightly depressed and um, shell-shocked um, how near impossible my dream would be. Can either of you tell me um, what ideas your parties have in helping young people like me become home homeowners before we retire? Because at this rate, my dream house is a long way away from me. Chris Bowen. Thanks. Thanks for the question. It is a very important issue. There's lots of young families, lots of young individuals trying to get into the housing market, and it is hard. It's hard in Western Sydney. It's hard in many places. There's two big things that we can do to help with housing affordability. That's keep unemployment as low as possible because you've got a job. That's the best thing you can do to get into the housing market. And also to keep interest rates low. And interest rates are as low as they've ever been in Australia. But that's not enough in and of itself. They're the two big things we can do, the two really important things. We're also investing in housing affordability. Since 2008, we've put in $31 billion uh, into housing affordability in various schemes. Um, to help people make sure that we're eliminating homelessness, moving towards that, and trying to make housing as affordable as possible. So, and we'll continue to work across the board. There are some things state governments can do in terms of land release, there's things local councils can do. But in terms of the federal government, the best thing we can do is keep the economy strong, keep unemployment as low as possible, and keep putting downward pressure on interest rates. Time's up. Joe Hockey. Well, Chris is right. Unemployment is the key. And the fact is, in Western Sydney, it's 7.2% and rising. And uh, the government inherited an unemployment rate with a four in front of it. And now we're facing 6.25%, heading towards 800,000 Australians unemployed. You can't repay a mortgage if you haven't got a job. And from an accessibility perspective, the fact is there is just not enough supply of housing in Australia at the moment. And also, access to credit is a big issue, and that's why uh, one of the things we've pledged to do is have a proper financial system inquiry to try and get some more competition back into the provision of banking services so that you've got somewhere to go to shop around to get a better deal. Chris, there's a question of equity too, is it? I mean, uh, young people like that see their parents and grandparents were able to get into the housing market relatively easily. They can't get in. It seems like the baby boomers swallowed up all the houses. Well, uh, the society has changed, the economy has changed, and now people do need to live, uh, you know, make decisions about where they live. Uh, my parents moved to Smithfield in 1971 because that's where they could afford to live. Uh, it was a good decision. I've lived there ever since. It's a great place to live. Um, but it is hard for people, and I know people want to live close to where they work, and nobody wants to be on the train or on the freeway for hours and hours. Um, but as I say, and Joe agreed, um, the best possible thing we can do. Other programs are important, but being in a job and keeping interest rates yeah, low is the best possible thing. Joe Hockey, do you want to respond to that? And uh, on the question of equity, I mean, people see their parents and grandparents got easily into the housing market, they're locked out. Well, it's been a difficult time, Tony, because uh, until a few years ago, you could borrow 100% or 110% of the valuation of the property to get into a property. A lot of people, young people in particular, uh, would borrow a lot of money. Now they have to get that equity up front. And we've got to become a nation of savers in part. Uh, we've got to save that, that deposit, but also obviously the stamp duty. It depends on, on the package in each individual state. But 
It, it is hard. And, and the fact is, you've got to increase the supply. I mean, it's a market. Uh, there's plenty of demand and increasing demand, but what are we going to do for supply? Uh, I've got some plans on that, which we'll be talking okay. about before the That's end of the That's 30 conference. seconds. Uh, we'll go down to our next questioner, it's Andrew Huynh. Mr. Bow and Mr. Hockey, why has Australian politics turned into a constant obsession into who can reach a budget surplus first? Both parties claim to be responsible economic managers, yet what is so responsible about cutting spending to essential services such as health and higher education when the debt is still considered to be relatively sustainable by world standards? Chris Bone. Thanks, Andrew, and I agree with you. Returning to surplus is an important thing, but it shouldn't be your first obligation. Your first obligation, your first priority, should be to keep the economy strong, to have jobs and growth, and that's what we're doing. We've said we'll get to surplus, um, but we're not going to get to surplus tomorrow or next year. We could. Or ever. It would, it would mean... <laughs> it would mean... It would mean cutting... It would mean cutting services, like you say, or increasing taxes. It can be done, but it would be the wrong thing for the economy. Now, we've said we'll get to surplus by 2016. Joe won't say when he'll get to surplus, despite the fact he spent three years banging his chest about it. He won't actually tell you when he'd get to surplus. <laughs> but we've laid out a plan to get to surplus, but we're not going to put that in front of jobs and growth and, as you say, important funding for health and education. Joe Hockey. Well, a fair few of you here weren't born when Labor last delivered the surplus. Uh, and uh, the fact of the matter is they promised one year after year they won't deliver it. And why does it matter? It matters because Australia doesn't fund itself as a nation. We're running a current account deficit of around $50 billion every year. So we borrow from the rest of the world to fund our lifestyle. And that is clearly not sustainable. Other countries that uh, have big deficits, like Japan, they have a huge pool of domestic savings. We don't. Australians can't afford to keep running deficits because we expose ourselves to international markets in a way that makes us more vulnerable to what's happening overseas. And I think we're going to face a generation of global volatility in the economy. We need to inoculate ourselves now. If you don't run a surplus, when you have the highest terms of trade in around 100 years, you have an unemployment rate with a five in front of it. If you're not running a surplus at that time, when do you run a surplus? When do you live within okay. your means? And so when do you, Joe? When well, do you? I, I tell you what. When will you get to surplus? Well, we will get to surplus a hell of a lot of time well, before you, mate. I mean, well, tell us when, Joe. And, and you know why? Give us a year, Joe. You know why? Well, you know what, Chris? I'm not going to sit here and lie to the Australian people about the numbers. Every number Labor has had for six years, every number has been wrong. And when Wayne Swan and, and, and uh, Julia Gillard promised on more than 400 occasions they'd deliver a surplus, and they never did, and when Chris Bowen said on Radio National Labor had actually delivered a surplus, delivered one, uh, when in fact you hadn't, uh, I'd say to you, it's better to under-promise and over-deliver. We will live within our means, and we are prepared okay. to do what needs to be done to make that happen. Thank you very much. Now, back to you, 30-second response, but I'll, I'll put it as a question, because... Uh, didn't you just heard what was said there about the constant promises of a surplus being delivered by Wayne Swan and Julia Gillard? Didn't that hurt and your Chris credibility? Bell. Well, and yourself, I suppose. Well, uh, we laid out a plan of surplus, and yes, the world economy is volatile and things change, but that doesn't mean you don't lay out a plan, Jake. You're not even laying out a plan for surplus. We've laid out, I put out an economic statement. I put out the fact that the government's revenue growth was falling and here's how we were going to build to surplus over time. All our figures, they're clear to see, for people to praise, to criticise, what you will. Joe is hiding his figures because he doesn't want to show you the cuts to health and education that he no. will have to introduce. He won't put out the figures to the last week in the election campaign. Maybe after the ban on, on uh, campaign advertising is in, if you can't be honest with the Australian people, you don't deserve to be the government. Oh, okay, well, no, Hold on, hold on, hold on. We will come back to that. Well, that's an important point. OK, a quick response. I, 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 I want to agree with you. If you can't well, be honest with the figures. Australian people, we'll you can't be trusted because we'll you can't figures, be honest. We'll okay, all right, all right, all right. OK, I'm going to shut you both down because we've got more questions to go to. We will come to questions on that issue. The next question is from Beck Lees. 
Mr Bowen, the ALP has run us into more than a quarter of a trillion dollars in debt. Why should we trust you, yet another unproven ALP treasurer, who's relatively unknown and could change on the whim of caucus, to manage this debt? Why do we uh, not believe that you're going to go the same way as your predecessors? Chris Martin. It's a good question. Well... <laughs> Let's talk about debt. Yes, the government increased expenditure during the global financial crisis. Why? Because it was the right thing to do. It got us through without recession. You know, around the rest of the world, they don't call it the global financial crisis. They call it the global recession. We don't call it that because we didn't have one. One of the reasons we didn't have a recession was because we increased spending and yes, we went into debt. But let's have a look at that debt. It is low by international standards. But despite Joe's scare campaign, there are countries around the world that would do anything to get our levels of government debt. We've got triple A credit ratings from each of the three. <laughs> We've got a triple A credit rating from each of the three main ratings agencies, something that has never happened before. That recognises and respects the fact that our debt is low by international standards. And we have a plan to return to surplus, but if we're going to have a proper discussion about it, a proper debate, let's be honest about the size of the problem. Let's not have the scare campaign uh, that Joe and, and his party have been running for years, uh, putting our debt out, um, saying it's un unimaginable and high, when it simply is not true. Joe Hockey. Well, Labor set itself a debt limit of $75 billion and then it broke it. It said it had to break that debt limit because of the global financial crisis. They said it'd never get above $200 billion, and then they broke that. And they said it'll never get above $250 billion, and they broke that debt limit. And then they said it'd never get above $300 billion, trust us. And now, by Christmas, it's going to break $300 billion. Labor knows nothing about paying down debt because they never have. They never have. It's always easy to spend borrowed money. It's always easy to spend other people's money. But the waste is what we're paying with it with, right? Today, we heard 6,000 cheques are going out this year for $900 to people living overseas and backpackers that should have been paid four years ago as part of the stimulus. $6,900 checks are going out now for what happened four years ago. They have no speed limiter. And the only speed limiter on Labor, the only handbrake on Labor, is a debt limit and decreasing debt. And that's the only way Would we're going to get the economy back on track, is start to remove our exposure to international volatility in the wholesale markets. A uh, quick follow-up to you, and that is uh, you've talked about inheriting $400 billion worth of Labor debt. Are you talking about gross debt or net debt? Well, it's heading towards gross debt, yeah. $400 and, billion, that's right. Uh, do you accept that most economists would use the net debt figure? Well, it depends on the quality of the assets. <laughs> but it's the same. Can I tell you? There's two things, Tony. One is the quality of the assets, mm. and, you know, frankly, I don't think the MBN is in great shape. That's meant to be one of the assets, apparently. And secondly, secondly, uh, this is money that has to be repaid. You pay interest on it. So the interest bill is in excess of $10 billion every year. Yeah, but do you, accept, do you accept that the net debt figure, which most economists would use, is $184 well, billion? Well, it, it's, 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 less, it's less than half of what you're saying. Well, no, because it's going up. It's still less than half, Joe. Oh. You can't... <laughs> OK. If you don't and, think, and if you don't think debt Joe, matters, what have you ever done to reduce debt? No, I think debt does what, matter, Joe, but what, I think it's important to be to honest it? about it, Joe. That's oh, like saying sorry. you've got a mortgage and not, not revealing the fact that you own a house as well. But you've hang got on, to be you honest with the Australian people about this. But you started with no net debt. You started with no net debt. Now, yeah. according to Tony Jones, it's $184 billion, yeah. but even on your own debt limit, which we have to borrow from the rest of the world. We're borrowing 86% of our gross debt from the rest of the world. We owe people overseas that money. We owe them the interest on that money overseas. And that is going to break $300 billion before Christmas. Okay, Someone I, has I, to I'll pay. go back to uh, the Treasurer for this. And look, it is a, a fair point, isn't it? I mean, $184 billion is still a huge turnaround mm -hmm. from what you were left when you came into government as Labor? And it comes back to the questioner. Why? Why have we done this? We've done it because it was the right thing to do for the economy. We are 14% bigger than we were during the global financial crisis as an economy. 
Uh, most countries around the world would, are nowhere near that. Most are the same or smaller than they were during the global financial crisis. We've got yeah, low unemployment relatively. Asia, We've got contained That's inflation. Right. That's just and we right. have low debt compared to the rest of the world. Yes, sometimes it's the right thing to do for governments to go into debt. Sometimes it's the right thing for families to do, to go into debt, if you take out a mortgage, because it invests in the future. Just like families invest in the future by taking out a mortgage, the sum looks huge when you're in your early 20s and you're, and you're planning the rest of your life and you think, how am I going to pay back this debt? But you do, and it's the right thing to do because you invest. And like we've invested, we're investing in the NBN, we're investing in productivity, we're investing in infrastructure, and we're investing in jobs and growth. And that is the right thing to do for Australia. But why is unemployment going up? Why is economic growth falling? Why is the deficit increasing? And why is the debt increasing? If you're doing such a great job, why is that all going well, wrong? Can I a uh, quick follow-up to you, because you could well be in government uh, shortly. How long will you take to pay off that debt? I think this Whether is a generational challenge. Whether it's 184 or 400 billion. Well, it, it's a generational challenge. There's no Telstra no to date. sell no. to pay down the debt. Yeah. Well, there is no Telstra to sell. There's no Commonwealth Bank to sell. Uh, the assets that are there are worth very little. You can't sell the assets to pay off the debt. The only way you can pay off this debt is to run surplus after surplus after surplus. Now, when we're in government, 10 of the 11 years we are in government, we ran surpluses. Every year Labor has been in government, it's run deficits. And that's the challenge. That's the problem. That's is they don't know how to pay down debt because they never have. Joe, that's 30 seconds. And 30 seconds for you, and then we'll move on. More rhetoric. More rhetoric from Joe. More bluster. More bluff. No date. He talks about the importance of paying. What's your date? 2023-24. There's my date. What's yours? <laughs> yeah. I think that is in your dreams, mate. Bluff and I bluster. I think that's in your dreams. <laughs> Bluff and Dude, bluster doesn't Labor, pay Labor's back Labor's going to pay off. So that would be five elections away, four or five elections yeah. away. Right. OK, all right. Let's, let's, That'd uh, be Julie Gillard's turn at that point. Let's, let's, right? let's just call a halt on this one for a minute. Sorry. We'll go to our next question, which is still related to this issue. It's from Tim Shepherd. Thanks, Tony. I'll direct this to Mr Hockey. Um, as a swinging voter with absolutely no idea who I'm going to vote for in this election, What's the reasoning, tactical or otherwise, that you are withholding the costings for the policies until the very last minute? That's, for me, that's the most massive trust killer for the whole campaign. And how am I or anybody supposed to compare the parties on some e equal footing? Well, that's a good question. Uh, and I'll give you a good answer. The, the coalition's already announced $17 billion of savings. Right? The government hasn't announced any savings. And why? Because the government, the Labor Party and Kevin Rudd, they can't talk about the past because they're embarrassed. They can't afford the future because they don't know how to pay for it. What we've said is we have $17 billion of savings already announced and on the table. And as we go through the campaign, we will release our policies and we'll tell you how much the policies cost and we will also be announcing savings along the way, further savings along the way. So the campaign still has three weeks to go. We still have policies to announce. Uh, unlike the Prime Minister, uh, we don't go around and have thought bubbles, on the run thought bubbles during a campaign, like Northern Territory, uh, where he announced cap company tax cut at three different levels for two, two different jurisdictions. That's quite an achievement. But from our perspective, we're saying we will put on the table our savings, as we have, and be totally transparent about it. But we have a process that we're following through. Chris Bowen. Your question is 100% right. If you can't explain to the Australian people how you're going to pay for your promises and fill your budget problems, well, then you don't deserve to be in office, Joe. You have to be upfront with people. We have. We brought down an economic statement. It had tough decisions in it, decisions that some people would be unhappy with, uh, that they've expressed their views about. But we've told people what our decisions are. And we've been upfront about so it. So you've got no and, more savings and, and no more costs. And so we have Is that built right? our Just savings. Have his minute. We've built our savings into our economic statement and we're complying with the Charter of Budget Honesty. Now Joe's figures don't add up. They just don't add up. He's promising all sorts of tax cuts, he's promising to return to surplus. Uh, and the savings he's put on the table, and they're substantial, I accept that, he's put savings on the table, like abolishing the school kids bonus, but they're not enough, Joe. You need more. You need more to make your sums add up. And you should tell, you should tell the voters a, what they are. This is like a scene out of the life of Brian, you know, where they say, what are, 
what have the Romans ever done for us? These guys say you haven't put any savings on the table, but now you accept we have put, put savings I on the table. Sp- I accept so you've I accept you put some, but they're not enough, Joe. Right. They're not enough oh, to fill your budget black hole. No, they would. They're not enough to fill your budget. No, black your hole. budget black hole. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Can I can I interpose with a question? Sure. Um, for the sake of transparency, you have announced $17 billion worth of cuts, but you've spent them all already. Mm. Uh, if you have new policies, how much more are they going to cost? How many billions are you talking about? So at least we've got a ballpark figure. Are you talking about another $13 billion it'll worth savings? It'll be a modest savings amount. That you need it'll to be get? a modest will, amount. Will it be more than $10 billion? Well, it'll be a modest amount. We are running a modest campaign. But is more than $10 billion modest well, I'm in not your going, view? I'm not going to get into the figures. I'm not going to sit here no, and get into No, don't get into the, the figures, Joe. Well, I'll I tell you why. Couldn't have that. <laughs> I'll tell you why. I'd, I'd love to announce all our policies right here on Q&A as an exclusive for you, Tommy, but... <laughs> Well, well, no, we're, I don't we're, encourage we're, me, I will, but, but, but actually, I'm not. Can, can I just say no. that no one actually expects you here to do that, right. but just tell us what they cost. Well, I've already said we've announced $17 billion of savings, and, right? Yes. We've announced $17 billion of policies. Uh, we've also announced our paid parental leave policy on the weekend, which is fully funded. How, We Joe? will announce further, further policies during the course of the election. You will see all of our numbers in a consolidated form. Sure. Right? Before polling day, the last two elections, Labor has released its costings less than 24 hours before the polls open. So please, no sanctimonious Joe, you, lectures you, from Labor about re- integrity. You released a five every point... number has got every number Labor has put out over six years has been wrong. Joe, you so released a five point five. So, Joe, you released a five point five billion dollar policy. And today you couldn't answer simple questions about it's how it's right. paid for. It's well, right. it's, you're on the radio, Joe. You no. couldn't answer a simple question. It's you're right. the alternative treasurer. This was a policy, your signature policy, paid parental leave, which I think is far too expensive for Australia at the moment. But you couldn't say how you would pay for it. Chris Bowen, can I just interrupt? Well, $500 yeah, can, I, can, I, can, I check, can I just ask $900 you a question? $900 checks to people living overseas is affordable no, no, for don't Australia no, Joe, to pay parental leave. Joe, it's your policy. Your and, po- $5.5 billion. And you couldn't put out how you're paying... One I don't line agree in a press release is not a costing. We're going to you come to that issue. We are, going to, we are going to come directly to that issue, but let me just put this to you. Why should they behave any differently than Labor did in 2007 when you gave your costings oh. two days before the vote? One day, one day. No. One day before the vote. Well, Joe, <laughs> Joe's been out there for three years talking about his credentials, how he's going to be an economic, better economic manager, what he's going to bring to the table. And now he is ducking and weaving because his sums don't add up no, and he will have to cut. Just like Campbell Newman promised no cuts before the Queensland election, now we are being seeing the public service ripped into reduction oh. in health and education funding. It does, isn't it happening, Joe? To all the people of Queensland, it's not happening, mate. Well, mate... Uh... Oh, I can? Yes, yes you can. Oh, yes, good. you can. No, I'm, okay. You've got a response. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, the fact is that this is the scare campaign. The whole Labor Party campaign is a scare campaign. If it's Campbell Newman or GST or $70 billion or whatever the case might be. It is People scary. want a positive plan, positive plan for the future, right? Yes. We're laying down a positive plan. Paid parental leave plan. We're going to abolish the carbon tax. We're going to abolish the mining tax. We've got a path to growing the economy. And you know what? We're going to ensure that unemployment does not keep rising at the trajectory level that you're promising. We're going to do something about job security. We have a real four-point plan seconds. for the economy. That's what we're focused on. And frankly, we know how to make a government live within its means because we've done it before. And we'll do it again because we have to. It's in the national interest that we have a government that lives within its means. Otherwise, you'll continue to have all these left-field taxes FBT, tobacco tax okay, increases, and so on. OK, we've got a, another question. <laughs> on a similar subject, it's from Kishore Napier Raymond. Mr Hockey, austerity measures implemented in European countries such as the United Kingdom and Spain have had largely disastrous consequences, basically increasing unemployment, slowing down economic growth, reducing household incomes, and generally affecting the already disadvantaged the most. Now, given that your, par- that your party has pre- pledged a return to surplus as one of its primary goals, what guarantee can you give the Australian people that they will not suffer from years of debilitating ca- um, public service cuts under a coalition government? Well, because... Uh...
Every year the Labor Party has been in government, every single year, as a percentage of GDP, they have spent more than the last year of the Howard government, which they said was a big spending government. And the problem is, it's not revenue, the problem is expenditure. That Labor doesn't know how to put a handbrake on expenditure, they don't know how to put a handbrake on waste. And if you're still handing out cheques for $900, or sending 16,000 cheques to people overseas for $900, or sending 27,000 cheques for $900 to dead people, which is what they did to try and stimulate the economy, what else? But if you don't do that, and the pink bats and the school halls, if you don't have any sense of prudence, then you are not going to get the budget back to surplus. Now, I don't believe in austerity, as it's defined, but I believe in being respectful and careful of other people's money. That's the way I was brought up in a family business, and that's what I understand. Because taxpayers' money is not our money, it's your money. And because it's your money, we've got to respect it and not waste it. And the examples of waste that keep coming out of this government okay, are now legendary. Chris Barron. Well, thanks for the question, Keishore, and you deserved a better answer than that. And Joe didn't give you the guarantee you wanted because he can't. He can't because that's his policy. As I say, he's got promises out there he has to pay for. He says he's going to return to surplus. It doesn't happen by magic. A bit of fairy dust here doesn't do it. It takes cuts. We're seeing it in LNP states across the board. We'll see it if Joe's the treasurer on September the 8th. He will cut into health, he will cut into education, well, said because it's the only... It. No, you haven't said you're not going to cut health, yeah, Joe. Tony, Tony Abbott said it the other day. Well, you haven't said health it. Health and when... education, we've guaranteed the well, four years well, of Gonski, so just... please tell the truth, that's all. Just I like ask. Campbell Newman <laughs> promised no cut. Please tell the truth. Just like Campbell Newman promised no cuts. Uh, the, the fact, we can always the fact, get into state governments. Where's the Eddie O'Bead these days? Uh, can I, I just yeah. Where is Eddie? <laughs> Let's start. Let's bring it on. Come on. We'll talk about state governments. OK, we know you're Let's losing the argument, Let's talk about the great Joe, state again. government here in New South Wales, thanks to Labor. Can I ask, uh, if health and education... Miranda Bly, she if, was another great if, uh, if health, Peter Beattie, he's doing well. Excuse me. If health Sorry. and education are yeah. immune from cuts in the future, what is not immune? Which government department is well, not immune? Well, we've said defence needs to... We've got to build defence spending over time, and we've quarantined that. And health and medical research is incredibly important. We've guaranteed that. So what is, not, are, what is well, not immune? All other areas, all other areas are going to be subject to us looking at getting rid of waste and ensuring that we can live within our means. And there will be restructuring. Of course there will be. There has to be. Because you can't keep handing out cheques for $900 or other things like that. You can't keep doing okay, that, right? right? Time, time's You've up got to, and you seconds. know what? The reason why I raise it, Penny Wong said today it was the tax system's fault. The $900 cheques are going out still today. Penny Wong said it. You know they're still building school halls as part of the BER? The government is still building school halls as part of the BER, okay, all right. which is a stimulus from four years ago. Joe, 30 seconds up. A really valiant effort at distraction, Joe, but you're not answering the question. Well, to be fair, he said health and education well, are immune from cuts. Well, he said defence is immune from cuts. Well, show so us. Show us where the cuts are coming. If you're so confident in your well, costings and how you're funding... You about the school kids' bonus. If there, you're right? so confident... You've already spent that money, Joe, and you oh. know it. If you're so confident that your costings add up and that you can fund them without uh, cutting health and education, then show the Australian people how you're going to do it. And don't Sorry. do it Don't do it after the on, blackout on, on. on advertisements in the last week you're of the campaign. You're spending the whole debate... Don't do it after our debates. Do it now. Release your costings as you go, as we do, and release how you're funding the costings, not the fudges that you're right. putting in your press release. Okay, one how line. about this? How about this? How about, instead of talking about me, you talk about what you want to do for Australia for the next three years. How about you answer the and questions? I'm, I'm that happy to answer you. the question. I've given the answers. But it's just a pl what is the plan for the next three years for Australia? We will be coming, we will be coming to the future within the questions. The next question right. comes from Peter Harwich. Harwich. Um, tax is a necessary evil which allows us to live the comfortable lifestyle and have the luxuries we have in Australia compared to other countries around the world. Given that the GST is one of the most consistent and effective way um, of increasing revenue for the government, why has the Labor government criticised any review of the GST and why has the Liberal Party been so quick to dismiss its, incre its increase? Chris Barnes, I'll start with you. 
It's a fair question, but it is a fundamental matter of policy and principle for us. The GST does impact on lower middle income earners more than it impacts on high income earners. Because if you're on a low income, you have to spend more of your income to survive. It's just a fact. And therefore, we don't think it's fair to increase the GST on those who can least afford it. And that's exactly what would happen. So you can't, it's the role of government to set policy. When we had a tax review, we said, don't look at the GST. We're not interested in increasing it. Now, you can criticise that, and that's your right, and I fully respect that. But that's our position. Joe could do the same. He's promised a tax review. That's fine. He could put the same parameters on the tax review as we have said and say, we're not interested in increasing the GST or putting it on food because that would be fundamentally unfair. Joe hasn't done that, uh, and that is why there, there are serious questions being asked about the GST under a Liberal government. Our policy is very clear. No increase and not broadening the base onto, the, onto food and the other things that are exempt. Joe Hockey. Well, the fact is the GST is a state tax. The revenue goes to the states. All the revenue goes to the states. Uh, and we've said we are not changing the GST, full stop. It is the biggest challenge for everyday Australians at the moment is cost of living. That's the biggest challenge. And increasing the GST increases the cost of living. And we're not, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We want to ease the cost of living burden. But we also want to have a proper process for dealing with taxation so that there is stability and predictability in decision making. I mean, what have we had out of Labor? We had mining tax, carbon tax. This FBT change the other day is a complete disaster. And they said it was for Maserati drivers. It's actually people driving Holdens and, and Toyotas. And this has come out of left field. And they're on $65,000 a year, these people. And they're now being, facing a bill of an extra $1,500. So we want to have a proper process okay. so the community can come along and understand the need for tax change and then vote on it, and then vote on it, so that there's no left field promises before the election and something very different after. Okay, can I just uh, confirm, just listening to what you just said there, um, if you look at the GST in the tax review, what you're saying is if you're going to ever go back to look at raising the GST, you'll give people the chance to vote on it. Is that yes, what you're saying? If that would, of course it has to be the case. Right. It has to be the case. People have to have the right to vote on something as contentious like, as that. And by the way, we're not changing it. We're not changing it. Now, if but people want to... So, but how, can so I just, can just, I just, 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 just in terms of the consistency, how can you say both things, which is... If you want to change it, people can vote on it, but you won't change it. Uh, well, that's not right. That's not right. I love you, Tony, but you just verbal me, right? <laughs> what I said, we're not changing the GST. Full stop, end of story. Now, what Labor does is they take a little part of a snippet of an answer and then they paste it and turn it into a scare ad. and you know, it does, It's not conducive to good public discourse. So let me be very, very blunt. Very blunt. We will not be changing the GST, full stop, end of story. No matter how many terms of government. I, I've said it once, I'll say it again. We will not be changing the GST, full stop, end of story. Why are you reviewing the GST if you're not going to... Well, it, why, why are you reviewing... Because people are entitled to put forward submissions, like that gentleman right next to you, who obviously has a strong issue about it. He can put it forward. But I'm saying what the Governor Day will do. Now, out of their Henry tax review, uh, proposals came forward for death duties, for a, a tax on the family home, uh, for a range of different taxes. They didn't rule them out before they had the okay. Henry tax review. All right. Okay. But now they're all pious afterwards. I I'm going to have to give you 30 seconds to respond. Well, I think, Joe, you're at sixes and sevens. On the one hand, you'll say no. you'll never do it. On the other hand, you'll say there's a review. If the review no. recommends it, if the review recommends it, Joe, are you really saying you won't accept the review's I recommendations ever? Now, remembering that if a, gov a new government's elected, the chances are, to be frank, that you're in for more than one term. That's how Australian politics works. Uh, and you are saying that you will never okay. increase the GST, even if it's reviewed. Then why put it in the review? Do what we did what, and rule what, it out. With the carbon tax? Do what we did and what, rule it out of the review, tax? Joe. Oh, right. Do what you did. So tell the Australian people you won't have a tax before the election, then introduce it straight afterwards. OK. <laughs> All right. OK. Yeah. All right. I mean, so, Joe, that, we... That's a great model. That's a great model. That's a great model. Right, you're in full distraction you mode today, Joe. You're in full distraction you mode. You've, you've, made, you've made a good point. Uh, let's go. Coming up next, we have two questions on the paid parental leave scheme. The first is from Ragwa Sharma. The second from Angela Chen. 
Ragwa Chama first. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, Tony Abbott is a self-confessed convert on paid parental leave. Uh, I was just wondering if he, he could actually convert on some other issues as well, and is it uh, not an act of actually trying to uh, cheer up some women just before the election? Uh, but more importantly, the paid parental leave appears to be quite uh, discriminatory. It appears to actually favor women and, uh, who are rich, and uh, it's against women who are poor, as well as men. I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Hockey, could you please um, uh, clarify this policy? And also, I know- No, we're going to leave you there. Thank you very much. And Angela Chen. Stand up, please. Thank you. Um, Tony Abbott is determined to bring in paid parental leave up to 26 weeks. Businesses can't afford it, and they don't want it. Now, if a couple do want to start a family, why should everyone else have to pay for it? Joe yeah. Hockey, two points there. Start with you. <clears throat> You know, um, I grew up in a, uh, in a small business family and there were uh, young women that were at the front desk answering the phones and whenever they uh, wanted to have children, they'd go to the public service or they'd go to a bigger firm because our firm couldn't afford to pay parental leave. Uh, and that was, they were on very modest salaries, nothing significant, really significant in terms of remuneration. Our paid parental leave scheme gives those people the very same opportunity as others in the public service and in big business. People should not be penalised for having children. It is in the national interest that we encourage Australians to have children. And people should not be financially penalised for raising a family. It is so important for our country. So our policy ensures that small seconds. business for the first time is on a level playing field with big business. Small business does not have to pay it, and the lowest income women do not get financially penalised for, for going out and that's having a, a that's child. That's a minute, Joe. And Chris Bowen. There's nothing wrong with paid parental leave. We introduced the first paid parental leave scheme in Australia, but it's got to be well designed. <laughs> it's got to be well designed and it's got to be affordable, and Joe's and Tony Abbott's scheme is not. The Business Council of Australia called it policy on the run, and they're right. Didn't even take it through their shadow cabinet or their party room. Well, that's complete and rubbish. Well, Joe, and, and the sorry. National Party says they'd vote against it, and you've got... Uh, <coughs> Only your party room leaks, mate. Ours doesn't. You, ours is ours watertight. That's a matter we of fact. You, you, know, you know, Joe, it's a matter of fact that you didn't take it through your party processes right. because it wouldn't have been approved. You've got Liberal MPs out there saying they hate it. You've got the National Party saying they'll cross the floor. You've got the Premier of Western Australia today saying it's far too much and we're not making that's a contribution. Not right. And you've built in a contribution from the states to your costings, so your policy's fallen apart in 24 hours. Why? Because it's far too big, it is not fair, it is unaffordable, and it's the wrong policy. Okay, I've just got to follow wrong. up with a question, uh, Chris Bowen. Uh, you say it's not fair, but actually mothers on low wages get much more under the coalition yep. scheme than they get under the Labor scheme. That is exactly why people like Eva Cox uh, and the Greens, for that matter, support this scheme. So Tony Abbott says a mother on minimum wages will be $5,000 better off. A mother on average wages, $21,000 better off. So how can you say that is not fair? There's no question it's a, it's a bigger, more expensive scheme than ours. No question about that. I accept that But completely. you said it wasn't fair. But it, it also has a much higher payment for people on higher incomes than ours does. It also... But that's because it is a workplace entitlement. If you have sick leave or you have annual leave, you are paid at your replacement of wage. Why is maternity leave meant to be paid at the minimum wage as you pay? Because it's paid by the government. Because, because it's paid, paid by... The bottom line is... Paid by the taxpayer, Ours is paid Joe. by 3,000 largest businesses, mm. right? And why? Because they get the benefit improved, workforce participation. They get the benefit of this scheme, but the biggest beneficiaries are small and medium-sized enterprises, and the biggest beneficiaries are the women of Australia. Of all the people earning $100,000 a year under the age of 50... 2% are women. Okay. Just 2% right. are women. Joe, How is that fair Joe, in a modern society? You've gone over 30 seconds, but just a quick follow-up. The Australian newspaper today looked at this mm. very closely and concluded there was a $1 billion missing a year mm. in your costings. Where's yep. that extra $1 billion going well, to Well, I don't from? know where the Australian got their figures from, but they're wrong. 
So you're saying it's fully funded from the people? It is fully funded. And, Absolutely. And, and, when will, and when will you release the complete figures As for part that of the costings and not, not Friday, too far away? Friday before the election, I think. Well, All right, well that's your benchmark. We'll do better. Let's uh, move on. Brendan Thursday. Ma is our next questioner. Brendan Ma. Thank you, Tony. Mr Bowen, previously uh, and quite recently, Prime Minister Rudd proposed to cut the company tax rate in the Northern Territory by one third, even though members of the Labor Party uh, in particular, David Bradbury uh, previously called such a proposal from the coalition as a policy that would divide Australia in two. Why has there been such a sudden shift in the tune from the government? And how can we be assured that this new policy isn't just exploiting the Northern Territory potential as a mere political football? Sure. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Brendan. The north of Australia has enormous potential. It is very expensive to do business up there because of the distances involved. It's also an area of great and unacceptable poverty uh, in, in many parts of the outback in particular. So it does need to be developed. What Kevin Rudd's done, frankly, is shown a bit of vision. He's shown a long-term plan. Um, he said very clearly, you know, this is something we're not going to do tomorrow and we need to talk to the states and All territories and we need to talk time. to business. Um, but sometimes people say to me, where's the vision in Australian politics? Uh, well, there is a bit of vision there to say the north of Australia can play a role. We need to change our economy, we need to diversify, we need to do more things. We need to reinvigorate our cities, but we also can't forget the north of Australia. Um, if you've spent time there, as, as I have, as Joe has, um, you can see the potential. Uh, but it's potential that needs government intervention to be realised and assisted. And that's what Kevin Rudd's talking about, and I don't think that's a bad thing. All right, all right. quick follow-up to you on that. Uh, what's the projected cost of doing this down well, the track? Well, let's be clear about this. We're talking about costings. What's the cost Yeah, we've put one? in the costings for the four years that are impacted by the budget, and then we've said beyond that, this is our plan. We're going to talk to the states and territories. Oh, we We're going to talk to business. Oh, consultation, what a terrible oh, thing, yeah. Joe. What a terrible thing. OK. After four uh, years. Four uh, years of consultation what a, what a, and then you pay for it. And, and, and it is about a long-term plan. It is not about in this budget cycle. But it is to, about but going you've got, But you've got to put money around a long-term plan. Yeah. People want to know how will. much something like cutting a third well, of the, the Northern, company tax. The Northern Territory is about 1% of the Australian economy, for example. So it's, it's, it's not... Um, a big part of the Australian economy. And if Gina, and if, can... if, if Gina Reinhart moved her entire business to the Northern well, Territory? And you'd have the rules in place. You'd have all the rules in place to ensure it was genuine economic activity, uh, which was really developing the North. And I, I understand it's controversial, and I understand if you haven't um, you know, been through the North and seen the potential um, that it's something you would ask the questions about. And it's quite right to do so. But it is a long-term vision, and it will be an important part of Australia's future. Joe Hockey. Well, thank God policy theft is not a criminal offence. Um, you know, these guys were ripping into us about our Northern Australia policy and now, now they're complete converts. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. It's quite the turnaround. And we welcome the zeal. We welcome the zeal that you guys have for Northern Australia. Uh, look, the fact is Kevin Rudd went up there and had nothing to say. And he said in, the, in one press conference, and he made it up, it really is terrific reading. Uh, he said, first of all, he said, we will reduce company tax to one third of what it is, which is 10%. And then he said in the same press conference, no, we'll reduce it by one third, which means it'd be 20%. And then he said, we're just going to reduce it. And then he said, we're going to apply it to Darwin. And then he said, we're going to apply it to the Northern Territory. And then he said, it'll be new companies. And he made it up as he went along. That's not the way to lay down a plan. We had a plan we've had a plan for Northern Australia out there, right? And it's great to see Labor now up. believes in lower company tax, because we've already announced a reduction in company tax for all companies right across Australia and here in Western Sydney as Except well. Okay. Okay. So 30, 30, 30 seconds. Equal opportunity for right, people to make a buck out. 30 seconds to the Treasurer. A company tax for all companies except for those you're putting a levy on to pay for your parental leave schemes. So 199 no out of 200 companies no. to be the biggest, get the company the biggest... tax cut in full. Yeah, which happen to be the biggest companies in Australia, and they'll pass it on to the Australian people. Do you people. want to use any time at all to defend uh, Kevin well, Rudd's announcement? No, no, no the I, I mean, <laughs> I'm more than happy to. I've, I'm also responding to Joe's sure. nonsense, and it's that the 30 seconds in, is to respond to the mistakes and nonsense that Joe's just um, said. But, uh, I, look, the, no, the Northern Plan is an important thing for Australia. There are immediate things that we're doing, like the Ord Irrigation Scheme, which is important for that part of Australia. We've funded that, we've put that in our budget. But it's also talking about the future. Not everything is about the immediate budget. 
It's also about well, what sort of Australia we want in 20 years' time. What do we want for the north of Australia? It shouldn't be forgotten. It's about what sort of economy okay. we want That's just and where sense. do we want economic activity. Okay, our next question is on uh, a different subject. It's also on about how you're going to pay for it, and it's from Ben Kite. Given the Liberals have committed to the NDIS, if you are to be elected as the next Treasurer of Australia, can you tell us how you'll fund this scheme in full, as it is expected to cost over $15 billion when the Medicare levy only raise, raises up to $3 million a year. And Mr Bowen, if you are to be re-elected, re how will you be able to fund this scheme as well? Joe Hockey, it's $15 billion a year. Well, this is, you're absolutely right. And this is why we constantly put pressure on the government to explain where the money was going to come from. And Julie Gillard announced the levy. We offered bipartisan support. We offered bipartisan support because we believe the NDIS must be achieved. But it's only the coalition that is going to deliver the NDIS. And we are going to have to make savings. We're going to have to make savings in other parts of the budget after four years. Because whilst the government has accounted for the funding in the NDIS in the first four years, after that, the money has to come from somewhere. And otherwise, it's not going to be a sustainable scheme. Now, who do you trust to find the savings to actually make the NDIS real? Do you trust Labor, who have a history of criticising savings and actually running deficits and therefore paring back on schemes? Or do you trust us, and the people who actually built up Medicare, the people that actually have said all along, we offer bipartisan support for the NDIS? Chris Bowen. Jo sorry, I was just dealing with Joe Hockey claiming credit for Medicare. But, um... <laughs> You know, thanks, you might claim the, the question, ideas, ben. but we always end up paying for yeah, them. You mate. opposed Medicare <laughs> for generations. Oh. Um, ben, thanks for the question. Disability no. care is a scheme which is overdue in Australia. Um, I'm glad that the... <laughs> I'm glad that the opposition, to give them credit, has come on board and supported it. It was not easy to introduce. Uh, we put, took it to the Productivity Commission. Um, they gave a report on how it should be done. We did have to increase tax to pay for it, increase the Medicare levy. Um, that's something that was very controversial when we did it. But I think the right thing to do, because I think all Australians would recognise that as a decent, compassionate nation, it's the right thing to do now. It's overdue. Um, the increase in the Medicare levy um, does make the contribution that we need over the budget to pay for it. Uh, it will continue to grow, and I think it's a great thing for Australia. Uh, very briefly, mm. do you have any clue at all where the extra $15 billion well, a year will come from after that? Well, we're talking will about, again... In other words, no, no, clearly, will you have to raise taxes in order to pay for no, these I'd, big spending initiatives? That's what people want to know. No, I don't accept that. We've increased the Medicare levy to pay for it over the budget uh, estimates. That's what you do. Um, we'll implement it. Uh, Joe says trust the coalition to deliver it. Well, it's the Labor, Labor government which has thought of this, implemented it, and we're the ones who will deliver it. Uh, Joe Hockey, 30 seconds to respond. <laughs> Can I put it to you, do you have a clue where the 15 billion might come from? Well, uh, if you look at the PFO that was released and the Treasury assumptions about growth in revenue, uh, that may address it provided that you don't have continuing growth in expenditure. But that's not the end solution. You have to have savings. You have to have savings. Otherwise, these things aren't sustainable. You know, uh, people with disabilities are, are the most vulnerable in the community. And that's why Tony Abbott and the Coalition have supported this. But like everything else, we're the only ones that are going to make it sustainable okay. by paying for it. That's and the, that's the way it has to be. Uh, that's your 30 seconds. Uh, do you want to respond? Uh, no, look, I think it is good that it's a bipartisan policy. As I said, it was a good thing that Labor proposed it, um, took it through the Productivity Commission, a very thorough process about how the scheme should work, and put the okay. increase in the Medicare levy on the table as being the right and decent thing to do to pay for uh, the insurance policy, in effect, for what could befall any Australian. Thanks. OK, our next question is about another big spending policy. It is from Cynthia Ford. My question's for Joe Hockey. How can you commit to funding the generous and expensive parental leave, but you cannot commit to funding the last two years, important years, of the Gonski report? Uh, 
Uh, well, the first thing is the government hasn't come clean on how much the last two years of Gonski actually are, how much they cost. The second thing is our paid parental leave scheme is paid by 1.5% levy on the 3,000 largest businesses. Uh, and in addition, there are other savings that are also are linked to the abolition of the existing scheme. So it is fully funded by abolishing the existing scheme and importantly imposing the 1.5% levy on the largest businesses. But in relation to Gonski, uh, I feel sorry for David Gonski uh, that what was originally recommended is very different to what the Labor government has just implemented. Labor's just taken in the 11 days, in the 11 days between the economic update and the budget numbers released by Treasury, Labor took $1.2 billion out of the education funding for Queensland, Western Australia and the Northern Territory. We've got to address that to ensure that those people over four years are not going to be worse off, let alone what Labor has, which is a blank cheque in the two years after that. Chris Bowen. Let's be very clear about what's going on here. We commissioned the Gonski report. We're implementing the Better Schools Plan. Tony Abbott, what Joe Hockey, Christopher Pine have spent the last two, three years going around the country saying how terrible it was. It was a Konski. They wouldn't do it. What happened? And Bill Shorten very successfully negotiated with states and Tony Abbott panicked when he saw that Victoria was going to sign on and he decided it was too politically embarrassing and he needed to close it down. They don't believe in it. Tony Abbott says there's nothing wrong with school funding. It's not broken. He's wrong. It's very broken. It needs to be fixed. We're committed to fixing it, not for four years, for six years and beyond. Where are you getting because the money? The where is all this money well, Joe, coming from? you just from? said you were committed to where, it. And yeah, that, where is all the money coming from in the two out years? How it, much is the last Joe, two years? Are you gone committed to it or not, Joe? Where, how no, much but that is, is, the last that is uh, Chris Bowen, that yeah. is a legitimate question. Uh, uh, looking down the track, where will the money come from? These are big spending policies. We've heard yeah. two in a row. And One requires $15 billion extra a year. The Gonski funding, how much is required? Well, just as we've laid out the funding, because we think schools are important enough to fund for the longer term, not just four years, but for six and beyond. And we're committed to it. We are really, we really believe in it. How whereas much is, Joe, but whereas how, Joe, but how much Tony, whereas cost? Joe, after and, the forward estimates, how much does whereas it cost? Whereas Joe and Tony Abbott don't believe in it, They've shut it down as a political debate. And you are right to raise that question. And we've laid out the funding for the six years, Tony. We've uh, laid it out. I'm just asking and, you and because and the public will not know that. Yeah, no, so well, how we've much laid, does it cost we've laid out, four years? We've laid out a four-year plan and our funding is over six. And, that, and those, those figures are there. What, we've where, laid it out, where, Joe. Where Joe, are those figures? In our, in our agreements with the states, Joe, which we've released. Well, for no, each state the numbers are not there. And, and your you comment just about $1.2 billion yeah, how long out did, of the How four long years. did Queensland and Northern Territory and Western Australia have to sign up? How many meetings were there between the Commonwealth sorry, and those states cut, and territories? You've just cut. They didn't want to sign up. So you're saying we should leave the money there, even though the states have said they, not, they don't want a bar of it. So if you know the figure, can you tell us what it is? Well, Joe's right in terms of um, we've said that Northern Territory. Western Australia and Queensland didn't sign up to, to the Better Schools Plan, so we haven't allocated the money for the states who don't want it. And the six-year plan, the total six-year plan, is all there, all laid out, not just over the four years, but over the full six. How much is what's been called out? Well, how, look, as I say, as I say, Tony, the, the full... What's your number? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd like to see some numbers from Joe. No, in, in, all, in all seriousness, we've laid out the plans. It's a six-year plan. Yes, it, it's expensive. Of course it's expensive. Um, but we haven't, we haven't laid it out just for the four years. It's, it's funded for the entire program. OK, all right. There are a lot of people yelling out in the audience how much, but we are running out of time. I don't think we're going to get an answer to that. The next question is a video. It's from Gregory Corr in Red Hill, Queensland. Is the Coalition considering the sale and or the privatisation of the ABC and their fiscal review or in the foreseeable future. Joe Hockey. There was a striking resemblance to you there, actually. <laughs> was, uh, no, we're not. The ABC is not for sale. Uh, it doesn't make a profit, does it, Tony? <laughs> It's a cost centre, so it's not worth anything for sale. So, okay. no, it's not for sale, I can guarantee that. They did it in New Zealand, so it's a legitimate no, question. Well, 
they must have ads running in New Zealand, but we they love do. our ABC. Believe it or not, Tony, we love our ABC. Well, while, while you're on the subject... <laughs> while you're on the subject, is, is the ABC immune from cuts? Because the Howard government, when they first came in, cut the ABC 10 and then 2% well, in two Well, the government's years. cut the ABC as well, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's not right. Um, I'd just say to you, is there... Is, is there any waste in the ABC at all, Tony? <laughs> Say that again. Is there any waste? If you're looking for waste, don't look here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to look at least sales remuneration then. Certainly not. not. Yours. Certainly not. Um, we'll just get a quick uh, response from uh, Chris Barn on this before we move on. Uh, look, I accept that Joe is not going to privatise the ABC. I accept that that's, um, that's his position and, and he'll honour that. I do think the ABC, though, has a fair bit to worry about when it comes to funding, as you said. Oh. It's what they cut in the Howard government. We have not cut ABC funding. Um, contrary, to your, uh, <laughs> contrary to your assertion, I think the ABC and the SBS are both very important national institutions. Uh, and they shouldn't have their uh, funding cut, and you won't promise not to. Well, a quick response to that. Joe Hockey. Uh, well, if there's waste, we will cut it. <laughs> All right, we've got time for uh, one last question. This one's from Carol Trewick. Greater Western Sydney has seen the permanent loss of many large manufacturing blue-collar jobs over the last 10 years with production moved to China or other Asian countries. Big businesses such as Bonds, CSR Glass, Clark and uh, soon Shell. What incentives can the federal government provide for any large corporations to start up new substantial manufacturing plants in Greater Western Sydney to employ thousands of blue-collar workers when the first choice of business now is to look to Asia for production? Joe Hockey, we'll start with you. You know, the starting point is the starting point is getting rid of the carbon tax. No. And why? I'll tell you why. Well, you know, you can some people can groan, but I was speaking to a major manufacturer in New South Wales the other day who also has a plant in the United States. His energy bill for exactly the same plant in the United States is $25 million a year. In New South Wales, here in Australia, $52 million a year. Of that $52 million, 12 million is a carbon tax. He pays no carbon tax in the United States. He sits there and he says, where am I going to invest money? My cost of, per unit of labour in Australia is $120,000. My cost per unit of labour in the United States is $80,000. I said to him, we will not be cutting wages. That is not what we do. We never have, we never will. But we have to get energy prices down, otherwise manufacturing will move. And under the Labor Party, one manufacturing job has been lost every 20 minutes in Australia since they've been in government. You've got to reduce the cost of doing business and That's building things seconds. in Australia. Chris Bowen. Uh, thanks for the question. It is a very important one. Whether it's Smithfield, Wetherill Park, Industrial Estate or Norwest, it is very important to Western Sydney, just as manufacturing is important across the country, but very important to Greater Western Sydney, as you said. What you've got to do is uh, invest in research and development, have the joint programs, the, uh, the um, uh, innovation hubs that we're introduced through our jobs plan, which is vital for manufacturing and on manufacturing more generally. You've got to work with industry as we're doing through the car plan, which Joe opposes, uh, in terms of working with yeah. manufacturing because the car industry is more important than the 50,000 people who are directly employed. It flows right through manufacturing yeah. and we're committed to it. Uh, and we think that's a very important part of the future. Joe's promising to take money out of the car industry assistance, and I think that's a backward step. All right, you do get to respond to that. Well, Labor's just imposed a $1.8 billion tax on the car industry, and it says, good news, guys, we're going to give you back $300 million. They don't understand that if you kill demand for a product, it doesn't matter how much you subsidise supply, you're never going to get a market that is sustainable. And Labor doesn't get that. They don't understand that the more built-in costs, the more regulation, the more red tape, the more carbon taxes, it kills the cost of doing business in Australia. And the only way we can address this is to get rid of the costs of doing business. And the biggest input cost at the moment, which is detracting from manufacturing, is the carbon tax. That's just All right, right, 30 seconds. It's the last 30 seconds. 
Well, it's just not right, Joe, to say that. Um, uh, we've gone then why to a floating... are the job losses in manufacturing? Well, You're since... doing such a great job. Well, since... Why are the jobs going well, out of Well, since the carbon price came in, Joe, we've seen job growth. Um, over one, 100... out of... one every 20 minutes. 150,000 jobs created since the carbon the price came in. We've seen economic up. growth um, of the same levels as before. You are just full of bluff and bluster and scare. You sat at Q&A and said you supported an emissions trading scheme last time. Um, there was an economic debate on at Q&A. You supported one in 2006, you supported one in 2007, you supported one in 2008. Then you asked Twitter what you should think about carbon pricing and climate change. And then, and when Tony Abbott became leader, you changed your, up till then, principal position. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> you want to quickly respond? Yeah. We've, we're virtually out of time. You've got a very short response, 30 well, seconds. Well, the only point I make is that if we do not compete on price, and one of the biggest input costs is energy. If we don't reduce our energy costs in Australia, we'll continue to lose jobs at a rate of one every 20 minutes under labour. And okay. that's not sustainable. Thank you. That's, thank you very much. That is our last question for tonight. But after covering uh, so many issues, we're giving the Treasurer and the Shadow Treasurer one minute to deliver their final statements. Prior to the program, we tossed a coin to determine the order of our speakers. As a result, the first speaker tonight is the Treasurer, Chris Bowen. The important choice for the Australian people in this election is who is better placed, who has the better positive plan to manage the changes in our economy. Our economy is changing. Our society is getting older, more economic activity is happening in Asia, and the mining investment boom is coming to an end. We need to create good new industries, new jobs. We need to work with unions and business to create those jobs. We need to invest, not cut. We need to invest in the future through the NBN, we need to invest in infrastructure. We need to invest in better schools for the future as well. We're the ones with the positive plan building on the strengths in the Australian economy. Our economy is very strong. We've grown through the global financial crisis and beyond when most countries have contracted. We've created jobs when other countries have been thrown into recession. The right team to get Australia through the coming changes in the economy is the Labor government which managed Australia through the most difficult international economic conditions in 80 years. We're the ones with the positive plans for investment, not the negative plans to cut. Yeah. <laughs> well, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chris has been Treasurer for three months. I was a Minister in the Howard Government for nine years. We ran surpluses, Labor's only ever run debt and deficit. Uh, if the economy is doing so well, why is unemployment rising? Why is the deficit growing? Why is debt increasing? Why are people feeling as though it's getting harder and not easier to maintain a standard of living? Only the coalition is actually offering a plan. Number one, we will live within our means. We have to reduce the burden on taxpayers. Number two, we have to get rid of the taxes. The carbon tax, the mining tax will go. We will keep the compensation associated with the carbon tax. We will grow the economy. Productivity is hugely important. Getting rid of a billion dollars of red tape. Seamless activity between Commonwealth and the state. And building infrastructure like West Connects here in Western Sydney. We will invest. We will have real, real reward for effort. Because that's the way we deliver prosperity. We've done it before. We'll do it again. That's all we have time for tonight. Wait a minute. That's all we have time for tonight. It's been a feisty, interesting debate, much more interesting, in my opinion, than many others. Uh, please thank Chris Bowen and Joe Hockey. And a special thanks to this great Parramatta audience and the wonderful Riverside Theatre. Please give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. Now. Next Monday, we'll be in Melbourne to join the Melbourne Writers' Festival, but rather than literature, we'll have our eyes firmly fixed on politics. With the Minister for Workplace Relations and Education, Bill Shorten, the Liberal Member for Higgins, Kelly O'Dwyer, British Labor MP, Tom Watson, who has spearheaded the inquiry into the phone hacking and Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, the opinion editor of the Australian, Nick Cater, and editor and author and host of the Wheeler Centre's Fifth Estate series, Sally Warhart. Until next week's Q&A, good night. Thank <laughs> you.